Welcome into Floyd Street's Finest. I'm Jack Grossman, joined by the host of The Drive on 93.9 The Ville. You catch him three to six every day over there, Mark Ennis. Mark, first of all, love the background, man. Looking really, really Thank good. You. Good over there. Give Angela all the credit for that. She's got the uh, decorative eye. This guy does not. <laughs> I love it. I could, uh, I could use that. Yeah, I got a fine, I guess, background. It's a start, it, man. It's, it's a, a start. start. But, but I mean, uh, you're rocking it over there. And... Man, we got a lot to get in to get into today, don't we? It's been another very quiet sure. week um, on the Louisville front and on the Kentucky front for sure. Nothing big's happening here, but Louisville and the coaching surge has hit whole new levels of crazy with Dusty May, not Dusty May, the fan bases. Um, I say fan base, I guess Kentucky. You know, it's kind of it, it, an interesting boat as well. We get to that a little bit later if you yeah. want to, but. But uh, we are a Louisville podcast, so we'll start on that end. And and now just kind of entering this abyss after a weekend of thinking it was going to be Dusty May. Now Dusty May's at Michigan. And where the hell does Louisville go from here? I, I think that's going to be the main themes of, of all of this. So let's start with this. How did you react to the news that Dusty May was going to Michigan on Saturday night? You know, um, this is going to I hope everyone will believe me when I say this, but there I did have a mixture of uh, kind of a feeling of like, oof, this is bad uh, for, for the optics of it. And obviously uh, that was a person that everyone, you know, that they were going to take a shot at Scott Drew. And then it was going to be this workmanlike, you know, kind of not on that tier person. And he was sort of I think a lot of Louisville fans had really spent a, a good week or so focused on him uh, emotionally preparing themselves for it and uh, and to have someone I think to have it be relatively unexpected I mean all the way up to you know Rick Bozich just tweeting pictures of what looks like they're set up for a press conference all that stuff right uh, then to have it be Michigan he's going to go to Michigan it just comes out kind of abruptly and I think compounded by the fact that Michigan didn't go in there and give him like five and a half million dollars or something the fact that it was a, a number that that seemed pretty workmanlike uh, for a hire like that uh, means that he picked Michigan and that's that stings and it doesn't look great and it doesn't give more than anything else I think what everyone was hoping for is that they've been gearing up to do this for months no I mean you've known since DePaul that yeah. you're gonna have to for sure DePaul that you're gonna have to do this say, DePaul, Arkansas, Arkansas State. Did, yeah, that, yeah that was the week where it was like Okay. Yeah, that's this, exactly this is right. <laughs> so that, like, that's that was five months ago. So you've had five months, and I think fans were hoping that the coaching search, no matter where it ended up, that it would look like we've just been dying to do this. Bam, couldn't get Scott Drew, but we put together the best offer we could, and you can't blame us for that. Got our guy. Bam, and then that didn't happen. Uh, but I do also want to just totally confess the tiniest bit of a feeling of relief. Um. The longer this goes on and the more you take calls and the more you talk to people and listen to people and, and try to expose yourself to people with different opinions than your own and all that sort of thing, the more I am uh, relieved. I don't think his energy like was going to be a great fit here. He's kind of cerebral, uh, very even keeled, kind of, uh, you know, like, like that. And while I think that Louisville needed a massive – increase in like acumen and that sort of thing and he would i think he would have been very successful here i don't want to but in terms of like the absolute perfect hire i think louisville need, does need a little bit more of an egomaniac kind of person uh we need that here you know like even though denny wasn't outwardly kind of like that he was supremely confident and you'd find out about it in other ways, but he, you would, you would still find out yeah, about taking it. Taking shots at Joe B. Hall and Kentucky, Absolutely. exactly, <laughs> all that stuff, right? He basically browbeat them into playing that game. I thought, yeah. I mean, that's that's the, because he could. Uh, and I don't think Dusty scratches that itch. I, I don't. And I do wonder how. I do wonder about how well that would have gone with somebody who I think is just a little bit more even keeled and and maybe would have expected. I think people to sort of just ro roll with it a little bit. Um, because no one's going to roll with anything here. Uh, but th like the, the goal is to find somebody who looks at that and is like, Oh, I, that sounds great. And I don't know who that is. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. I still think I would, I lie on the fact that I would have really liked dusty may, 
I Me think too. he's a really, really great basketball coach. And to do what he did at Florida Atlantic of all places is very, very difficult. And yes, I get it. They weren't like 31 and two this year or whatever. You do have to remember the American isn't a great league. That's still a step up from conference USA from yes. where they were. And they had that target on everyone's back and they still went out, beat Arizona double overtime, the non-conference beat Texas a and almost beat Illinois. It was a pretty damn good year there, especially again yeah. at Florida Atlantic. So so I, I, I do think that people kind of overshot that a little bit. But my thing is, I remember the, the day that, that Drew Diener kind of kick-started the coaching search, search yeah. rumblings where he said, you know, Louisville's going to go after Scott Drew. Jeff Goodman, Field of 68, had, had in the Field of 68 Daily that, you know, he had the thing that Louisville's you know, not going to not get big names, all that stuff that really pissed off the fan base, for lack of a better term. But the thing that never got talked about after that was the next bullet point was word for word, Dusty May to Indiana, question mark, don't bet on it. Because because he said Dusty May didn't want the pressure cooker of Indiana, his alma mater. Yeah. And that Ohio State, which obviously they want Jay Diebler, was a lot more likely than Indiana because of that. And I kind of apply that to this as well. I mean, Michigan is a very good job. It's probably a top 20 job. They've struggled in the NIL era in basketball because, you know, the question with Michigan's always been how much to do the donors and administration actually care about it. Cause they have right. as much pocketbook money, both donor wise, funding wise, big 10 money wise as literally any and more of them way more. Yeah. Of them. Yeah. Like they have like, like you look at, you know, who the biggest brands are in terms of financials. It's probably Michigan, Ohio state, Texas, yeah. like probably Texas first, but but it, it's those three schools in AM. Like, those are the four schools. <laughs> like, they have more money than literally anyone. And that's why I was surprised that, you know, I'm with you that it was $3.75 million. Cause I'm like, okay, yeah. Michigan's a good job. But I would think one, he would be able to le- leverage the Louisville job and the Ver- Vanderbilt job, which he was reportedly talking about, and others into more money, which I'm surprised that, that he didn't. And two, Michigan. I always thought if Michigan decided they were going to commit fully to basketball, they could outbid anyone. Obviously, they didn't need to do that. But they're in a spot where, if you remember the last two transfer portal cycles, Juwan Howard got commitments from Terrence Shannon and Caleb Love. Yeah. And neither one academically qualified. You had Hunter Dickinson, an all-American big man, leave because he said he wasn't getting enough NIL money. Like those are two pretty big red flags about a program in, in the modern age, no matter, you know, the fact that Michigan's been to five final fours and won a national title since 1989. And under John Beeline was one of the, one of the elite programs annually. in the country annually, yeah. but yeah. in the new era, you wonder, can, are they going to do those things? Are they going to have restrictions with the academic side? Are they going to be able to get the NIL that they need? If they want to, they can, but the question is, do they want to? So, for me, I found it interesting from that end. I always thought Ohio State was viewed a little bit better than Michigan because of that, that they kind of just went out and said, eh, we're going to hire the interim guy. We'll see how the heck that works out. But that is interesting to me that it ended up being Michigan because of all those facts, which obviously Vanderbilt would have been that times about 10 probably with, with how they are. are but I, but the money surprised me for sure. I do think uh, also the the other part that if you're a Louisville fan that, that probably should be – it's at least worth paying attention to, if not actually worrisome. Uh, if you've had this long, you know, the lead time you and I were just talking about, the idea of not finding out that that maybe Dusty May's demeanor is better suited elsewhere uh, after he takes another job when you were going to hire him, you know, like that's worrisome in the context of what we were just talking about with how in the interview process with Kenny uh, before we came on, like the interview process with Kenny, you know, it turns out Kenny had massive misapprehensions about what being the head coach here was going to be like, and that your interview process at least wasn't robust enough to stop you. You know, it, look, would it have required a lot of courage uh, from, from Josh? Yes. But, and look, maybe you, you, he doesn't get the job. Like I'm sure that there's a lot that goes into it, but I can understand if you're a fan looking at this and saying he maybe he would have preferred this job and the the amount of limelight and unsca- uh, uh, scrutiny and all that sort of thing, uh, this job better than Louisville, et cetera. Like that's the sort of thing I think that all, Louisville ought to be able to tell that too. Yeah, right? oh, like, absolutely. But I, I so think, that worries me. 
I, I think there's two angles looking at it. And I think they're both correct. One, just on the Kenny Payne thing, as, as we talked about before the podcast, I don't think Josh Hurd gets the job as the permanent AD if he doesn't hire Kenny Payne. I don't think he really had a choice in hiring right. Kenny Payne. Did you um, did you imagine what, you know, like the, the Denny era players would have done if Louisville didn't hire Kenny Payne and if they hired no, like Mac McMahon or something? Even better. No, even better. What if they had interviewed Kenny <laughs> And not and hire then him. didn't hire him. And basically were like, look, he bombed the interview. Like that's Yeah. I mean, it like, probably was an impossibility. Yeah. Like you could not do that, especially as again an interim athletic director. You could not do that. So now you have the two years of them going 12 and 51. And how much rumblings have we heard from from those people? Not since he got canned. Not very much. You know why? Everyone we haven't heard can, from him. Yeah. Well, we're never gonna hear from him. <laughs> I right. mean, I mean. And you know, walk, he'll walk in silence so, or That's move right. in silence, whatever the term was. He's free but, to move as much silence as he wants. <laughs> but, but I mean, there's a reason why we haven't heard from that contingency very much because they saw what happened on the court. They saw 12 and 51. They saw all the antics off the court. Yeah, They know it wasn't good enough. But without those two years, people wouldn't shut up about it. And so, so I mean, I, I do feel like he had to hire Kenny Payne in that spot. There just wasn't. One, there wasn't an obvious choice to hire instead of Kenny Payne. But two, even though I was never fully convinced it was going to work, it was me and Pat Jaggers filled in on the V show, taking all the shrapnel back in the day. And yeah. Kenny talked about how we didn't think it was going to work, but I don't think he really had a choice. But number two, and I'm not saying Josh Hurd is doing this, and I would argue he's not doing this, but it comes off like you have the big paper at the end of the semester and you just procrastinated it to the last minute, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah. I have been afraid that what was really happening all this time was Josh realizing that he, he was going to have to make a change, but but holding out hope until the absolute bitter end that he wasn't going to have to. And, and if so, this was all in vain. <laughs> yeah. like, and that's <laughs> that, I think, is the worst part. I think fans were hoping to at least with the hire and look, if the next guy comes in, whoever it is, we'll talk about it, but whoever it is, if he does a good job, this whole conversation is moot. But for right oh, now, for right now, I think what you were hoping for is one, you could go quoting a big game hunting and you, you make a big offer. And somebody's like, I know what Louisville is. Of course I'll take that. Or that you, you would have laser focus. I've had all this time to think I want that person and you get them. And this thing looks deliberate and intentional and you're ready to get going and now you're not going to get to do either one of those yeah and, and i'll add this too just kind of to your point about may and, and the personality wise that there's twofold here again i guess that's a common theme for me the last few minutes but but uh on one hand i'm like look if you come in and win games no one's going to care about the personality side of it. like no one was mad about chris mag being kind of brash when he was number one in the country in the that's middle right. of the second year it, it, it didn't really that wasn't an issue until he stopped winning. But on, on the same side, I think it's two s similar yet different conversations. You need someone that's going to understand the pressure trigger he's walking into and is going to embrace the fact that he's yeah. not the dude that was here during all this losing and all these scandals in the last six, seven, eight, nine years. But the fan base has sat through all this shit. And they're not going to have the patience for a Tom Crean like four year rebuild. Like the the, the, the coach yeah. needs to understand the sense of urgency of what he's stepping into, and know I'm going to have to win and win quickly and be at least a competitive, competent product year one. Yeah, they're gonna have to. The, the rather look, it's not fair, but no. like Kenny used all of your runway, like just he and did. Chris Mack did too. Yeah, but Kenny in particular, but oh, yeah. <laughs> in particular with 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 at the very broken. <laughs> yeah, right. With the at the very end saying, I told him it was three years and this what I inherited was broken and the year of zero stuff. Like the next guy, just for the sake of being different than Kenny, is gonna have to nail it year one. I I, I would think, you know, uh almost any competent coach, the expectation will be, especially if they really are going to follow through on resources for NIL to come along with him and that sort of thing. Uh, the, the, the next guy, you need to be like a bubble team next year. Yeah. The year one, uh, it needs to be dramatically different. It needs to be uh, that everywhere where there are issues, you can tell like, it's just a map, just give him time, that sort of thing. You know, all none of the stuff that Kenny ever 
did here. But you're going to have to do all that really from year one. Uh, the good news is, and this is what I've been saying is like kind of one of the silver lining thing. Like how many times are you ever going to be able to take the Louisville job and like a 17 win season is going to be worth like a ticker tape parade. You know what I mean? Yeah, never. But it will, you know, especially if you beat a, a good team or two, if probably something even just a little bit better than what Shrewsbury did at Notre Dame this year, you know, they were below 500. He's got, I think you got to be over 500, but like they beat some good teams. Or a Stoudemire, Georgia Tech, like they yeah. beat Duke and North Carolina and Clemson. Like they beat good teams uh, this year, lost games. But you could see like, man, if they've got players, they, they're going to be all right. And, and that's, I think, the feeling that those two places have is exactly what you've got to have after year one. Yeah, and I'll say this. I went to both the Duke and Carolina games at Georgia Tech this year. And I went they to play. the – Yeah, they play hard. And and it's a night and day atmosphere. I love my guy, Josh Pastner, um, fellow tribe member. But I, I went to – you know, I saw them upset a Miami team that made the Final Four two years ago. You know, and I was one of maybe 25 people in the building. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, there was no one there. I saw them – I saw the Louisville game against the Ford 28 team down, down in Atlanta in yeah. person. And there were probably more Louisville fans there than Georgia tech fans, which is again, a credit to Louisville, them doing the bus trip and all that. But still there was zero juice there. Like now they're selling out for Duke and Carolina. They're, they're, you know, excited about the program. It was more expensive to get into the Georgia tech Carolina game than it was to get into an, the Atlanta Hawks Lakers game. Wow. To see LeBron James and Anthony Davis. <laughs> like, like there, there is actual juice there. There is actual excitement, and the team wasn't great, but they played hard. And they won a few games. They beat Mississippi State in the non-conference, also. So I think you can have a year like like that. Even like you can generate excitement, lay a foundation, and say, "Here's the plan. Here's the vision. We're not there yet, but we're getting there." And be a competent. I mean, I agree though. You got to be somewhere near the bubble, at least like an NIT yeah. team or in whatever that new Fox tournament is. I guess the ACC is not a part of that, but. But but you especially with how many slots are open in the NIT and nobody days. goes to the NIT. Girl. No, come on. No, I think Louisville you gotta, would. Accept- you got to you got to be a bubble team or turn down an NIT bid next year. Yes, like, <laughs> <laughs> like a like a proper program. <laughs> like a proper program. <laughs> I, I I would think Louisville would jump at the at a chance to play the NIT right now. That it depends that's- on if you achieve up to the NIT or if you wind up in the NIT. That's what I think is the divider. If you feel like you wound up in the NIT, man. But if you like. We're supposed to be dregs and you made it to the NIT, you'd probably go for it. Right. Like that would be next year though. Like right. like little right. it, w- it would be fun yeah. and exciting. And whatever. I, my my theory's always been like with Indiana this year. Like if you don't want to play the NIT and you want to take your ball and go home or whatever, how about you be good enough to qualify for the NCAA tournament to where that doesn't matter? So like I almost feel like, you know, this is your punishment for not making the NCAA tournament. You gotta yeah. play these crappy games, but but for someone in Louisville spot next year, yeah, no, that would be – and it's such a weird thing to say about Louisville because we're not used to saying this about Louisville. But that would be a good foundation year one. Just, you know, say it's that where we want to be, but it's a hell of a lot better than what we've been. So It's let, on let, the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let's get to this. So I've been asked this question probably about – maybe 10% of the times that I'm sure you've been asked this in the last two days. The best month of the year is here, which is why you need to know that we are now partnered with BetMGM. We'll be using BetMGM lines to make all of our picks and we'll have special offers for the listeners and the viewers of the Field of 68 all through the NCAA tournament. If you haven't signed up for BetMGM yet, you can use the bonus code FIELD and you will get up to a $1,500 first bet offer on your first wager with BetMGM, regardless of whether or not that bet hits. Here's the best part. All you need to do is deposit and bet $10 of your hard-earned money. This is how you make it work. Download the BetMGM app and sign up using the bonus code FIELD. Deposit at least $10 and place your first wager on any game, and you get up to $1,500 in bonus bets, regardless of the outcome of your bet. Just make sure you use that bonus code FIELD when you sign up. Most importantly, we do have some fun stuff coming for the conference tournaments and especially for the NCAA tournament. Bet insurance tokens, college hoops, odds boosts, and... What I love the most, a nice parlay boost for anything you could possibly imagine betting on in the NCAA tournament from odds and getting an at-large bid to Final Four Futures to the highest seed to make to the Sweet 16. I'm calling it right now. BetMGM is the king of the prop bet. 
for your March Madness needs. So go download the BetMGM app, use the code FIELD, and sign up today. And while I've got you a quick request, the best way to support the Field of 68 and our content you get for free is to engage with us. Rate and review the pod. Like and share the YouTube videos. Tell your friends about us. It helps in a world where the algorithm is king. And now, back to the show. We've seen Goodman throw out, you know, you know, uh, Shaheen Holloway, um, Amir Abdul Rahim from from South Florida, Pat Kelsey. We saw Ty Spalding yesterday say Will Wade's now on the table. Diener and Pat Forty this morning kind of fought against that that idea. I mean, Josh Shirts is still sitting out there. What the hell is is Josh Hurd gonna do at this point? <laughs> like, like what what are names that he's gonna turn to? I think the, these are great questions that really none of us know the answer to. And in a weird way, I think he, two things at once uh, as a theme <laughs> of this podcast. In a weird way, uh, you're back to square one. And I think that with time having passed and the appearance of having been kind of picked over, uh, it's not great to be in that position, but you are. But I think you're free to kind of reevaluate. Uh, what matters to you and and maybe even kind of start over reboot this thing a second time uh and the pressure is way up because you're a week you're a week further into this the portal is open uh guys are going elsewhere i mean kyle smith is going to stanford like that's yeah. done and now you've got michigan and stanford and ohio state and west virginia have already done their whole search and you haven't and in addition to it just looking bad, those are guys that are now off the radar. Uh, and that's there. ACC folks, Stanford now, too. That's true. That's a good point. <laughs> SMU still got to hire one, uh, too, at this point, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not I, – I, I've i never thought that Will Wade was, was possible. But I would ask everybody who doesn't want Will Wade, and I'm one of them. I, I just – I mean, I just, just – whatever, right? Like, I just he just doesn't do it for me. But he does resonate. He resonates. That's with what the, I was going to say. <laughs> that, that chip on the shoulder part of the Louisville fan base that really loves assholes. And they just do. And in fact, I think oftentimes take someone being disliked as a sign they're doing something right. Like every fan base has that a little bit. Like everyone rallies around their guy. Like Baylor fans still defend freaking uh, Bryles. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not talking about that. I mean, Louisville fans do it with Patino. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. And did it with Patrino before. Yeah. Uh, like it's not just the natural fan defensiveness. I think Louisville fans really do have an above average. Um, if for most people, if they see a guy that's an a-hole kind of coach, they're like, and Louisville fans are like, okay, like, tell me more, you know, like just be. <laughs> Because being the being successful at Louisville has required a coach that's like everybody else, only more so. Like you just have to be more. And Dusty Mate did not have that. He was not an extra guy. You got to be. I think the Louisville coach has got to have a little bit of that in them somewhere. And who that is now, uh, I I think the great news is I think a lot more people are going to seem palatable to Louisville fans. But none of them are going to be all that exciting. Yeah. Like from day one, like all the emphasis is going to get pushed now to what does he do once he gets the job instead of the excitement of the hire itself. Yeah, I will say that's a well late. I was listening to um one one of the Field of sixty eight podcast right after the bracket got released last week, and and I think it was Terrence Oglesby. And, and some of them were interviewing Will Wade, and Oglesby said something along the lines of. Well, what did you learn from your year year off last year? And Will Wade, word for word, quote, and I'm quoting this says, "You mean when I got my ass fired?" And I and I hear that, I and I had this epiphany of, "Oh shit, that's the Louisville coach <laughs> right yeah. there." I mean, I mean he t- he took it in stride. He joked about it being a sabbatical, all that stuff. And I'm like, "What a phenomenal mindset to have of everything that's happened to him." Yeah, and, he and, is, and he he would never he would never sit up there and say that he wants to beat Kentucky by one. Yeah, like just the swagger right. and the and the attitude about it, like and the fact that one he can make as many strong ass offers as he wants these days. No one cares. 
Like, like I do think there is a level like dudes like him and and obviously Bruce Pearl's not a candidate, but like Bruce Pearl, Pearl and the barbecue yep. back in the day. I mean, Calvin Sanson and the and the phone calls and text messages to Eric Gordon, Robbie Hummel. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> I mean, I mean, all that stuff is is legal now. So I I personally I know Josh Hurd has his um you know he doesn't want to hire a guy that has a past because. Louisville's been through enough BS as it's been, and and I completely understand that. That, but at some point, it's like okay, these dudes, the things that they did with the NCAA, one, it's okay now, and two, it's like, was it really that big a deal? Some of these things to where, and well, wait, wins no matter where he goes. I mean, he came in. You think if he had the quote he had at McNeese when he took over last year, saying. Y'all lost 24 games. I guarantee you we're going to win 24 games this year. Then he backs it up winning 29, 30 games, whatever it was this year. You think that would resonate with Louisville fans? I mean, I mean, he's someone that, you know, has the attitude that again can turn things around pretty quickly with the recruiting and the portal and every, all the new age stuff that he's very, very good at. Look, I, I think Will Wade, um, Ha- checks a lot of the these boxes and almost uniquely checks kind of that persona box. Yep, and you can get them uh, for cheap too. More than anybody else that's probably gettable and out there, um, would probably come the closest to like when by the time the press conference is over, people be like, hell yeah. Um, and it's pretty obvious too uh, that he resonates with money people. You know, because I yeah. I, I think you've probably heard this too, that like kind of a group of people from LSU just like kept supporting him at McNeese. You know, it, like I've talked about this with Bud Elliott just the other day. Like I think coaches even get a little bit more of a shorter leash than usual now in the NIL era, because part of the responsibility is, is interacting with and keeping happy boosters. It used to be that that was the AD's job. You talk to me, I'll talk to the coach. Coach talk to me, I'll talk to the boosters. And now you got to really glide hand them directly. And, and that when you're when they're not happy with you, like you're, you're going to know it a lot sooner. Uh, and I think Will Wade clearly uh, has all of that going for him. Will Wade has never won shit in the tournament, though. He made a Sweet 16. He was been suspended that year, was he not? I got to go back and see if he was actually coaching or, or, or if he was back yet. Cause I, 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 I remembered him coaching, Either way, that's but I've heard it a couple cleansing. times. Yeah. Fair. Tournament success wise. But that's the whole point here is that every one of these guys that you might be interested in now has something about them. That's that's it, like, they're not well balanced. Yeah. Somebody's a lot of something and needs to be more of something. Every single one of them, pretty much Jerome Tang needs more experience. Just more experience, like as a head coach. Eric Musselman has never been to a Final Four, uh, and they fell flat on their faces uh, this year. Will Wade's never done anything uh, in the tournament, but Shaheen Holloway, uh, look, the Elite Eight, not a whole lot else, and he's kind of at his alma mater, and that's not yeah, nearly Jaheen, as romantic Jaheen's... after Chris after Chris May. <laughs> Shaheen just... always an interesting one to me because number one, I feel like he hasn't gotten more attention because of the fact that seen hall is his alma, alma mater he's only ending year two there we don't know what his buyout is because it's a private school um but you look at him he made the the, the elite eight run a couple of years ago they i thought got in, in two years respectable year one uh year two i thought got screwed out of a tournament bid to be completely honest i mean he, yep. they, they're one of what three teams to beat UConn and they, and they destroyed them in, in December. <laughs> That's pretty damn yep. impressive. Um, but, but you look at him and I go, okay, he's laying a foundation there. He's in a spot where you talk about, you know, NIL and all that stuff from everything I've heard. Seton Hall does not have NIL. Like it's a very, very tough place to win at in, in the yep. current climate. Louisville would be immensely better resources than what he currently has to where I think the ceiling's just a lot higher at Louisville than it is at Seton Hall. Plus, you want a guy chip on your shoulder, teams that'll play their butts off, all that stuff. Yep. That's what Gene Holloway's teams do. I mean, there's a reason why Dre Davis, former Louisville player, is such a good fit there. I mean, yeah. no, I, I mean, I, I, they play their butts off. But a big picture, uh, I think Richard Patino would be would do well here. 
Yes. I think Will Wade would do fine here. I think Shane Holloway would do fine here. Um, I don't know anything about Todd Kelsey. Right? Same. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I've joked on the air a couple of times that like Pat Kelsey is the name that you put on the list to look like it's a smart list. But I don't know anybody who wants Pat Kelsey. So I'm not talking. I would just, it's dumb. But I'm just not talking about him because I don't know anything about him. I've watched very little of Charleston, but from what I have watched, they do play up and down and they shoot a lot of threes. I mean, they're basically a, a poor man's Alabama. It's a good way. It is a good way of describing them. So I think you know part of the fans would, you know, like that style of play, but it's just you just don't know much about them. I mean, how much? And, and I, how I much don't, Charleston basketball are we watch? Right. <laughs> no, and look, he's a pack line Dino Gaudio kind of guy too. Yeah, people hate uh, that. And <laughs> and that's kind of, right. That's like fight uh, around here at this point. <laughs> I will say the the only other like name. You know, I would not rule out a name kind of seemingly out of nowhere, you know, at this point, like say like Buzz Williams or something like I just I wouldn't rule those things, those things out. Uh, but I will say I know that he has not like officially taken the St. Louis job yet. So I think some people are going to bring up Josh Shirts. I still don't like that idea at all. Uh, and for I just feel like there's a step you have to take between Indiana State and Louisville. There just is. And. Like, I know he's had great success everywhere. I think he'll do extremely well at the next place as long as it's increased, you know, that he's working with more and that sort of thing. Uh, I just feel like you're Louisville's one of those, you're, you're in the rarest of air, and he's never had to do any of that. And I would just be so concerned. I, I have Scott Satterfield and, like, the higher-rated recruits in mind. You know, where it was just like, he was just like, I'm just going to try to go around that instead of ever really getting comfortable with having to swim in those waters. And I, uh, I, I look at Josh shirts and I just, like, I want to see him do it somewhere just a little bit more higher profile before I would say this is the place for him. I, I would say on shirts, the fact that Louisville is so willing to go all in on the NIL side of things that might force his hand a little bit in, in a good way, I, I would argue to where he'd say, Oh crap! I got all this money. I might as well use it. <laughs> Type it. Yeah, but I'm, I, but I'm more worried about has Josh Shirts in his entire coaching career ever ever coached a guy who's there for the money? I mean, probably not. And I I worry about that because I don't even think Kenny was ready for that. When no. I don't think Kenny, like when Kenny got here, that whole world had changed in the time that he had left UK uh, and, and come back. And now every player at every, just about every decent high major is there, at least in part, if not entirely, for the money. And he didn't know how to talk to them. I mean, I would say this. I, I think one, shirts, even though it's a different caliber player, is still interacting with players. I mean, we could have said the same thing about Dusty May last year. And he was able to bring back everyone from the Final Four team in into a year two uh, of all that. That's I mean, true. everyone That's said, true. you know, uh, John L. Davis, Elijah Martin, Vlad Golden, all these dudes are going to leave for NIL, transfer port, all that stuff. He brought back 12 out of 13 players. The one dude they didn't brought back ex exhausted his eligibility. Yeah. So I don't know if it's fair to just say because he's never done it before. He can't do it for this one aspect where you look at everything else. And the dude has just won wherever he's been. That's true. And, and Indiana State's a very, very hard job to win at. And they had him ranked for the first time since Larry Bird was on campus in 1979. Nine, they, 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 I thought another team that should have been in the NCAA tournament yeah. instead of Virginia. Um, <laughs> to name one of them, but but I think you could have named about eight teams that should have been in instead of Virginia this year. I, I thought yeah. the committee did a t pretty terrible job on in a lot of areas <laughs> this season, but. But um, that would have been, I think, their fourth NCAA tournament appearance ever. I mean, you're at the bottom yep. of of the Missouri Valley Conference. I mean, that that's which is traditionally a pretty good mid-major league league. That, I mean, we see how good it is with the fact that you know Murray State and Belmont, two schools that dominate the OVC, have been in there for a couple of years now, and they're not doing jack squat right now in that league. They're really struggling in that league. It, it's I get it. It's not going to be like the big 12 or anything like that, but it's a good mid-major league that has three yep. really good teams. And 
Drake, who almost won a first round game, they kind of choked it away. Uh, Bradley's a really good team. And then Indiana State. I mean, it, it's a quality league to be able to turn that around and win and play a very appealing style of basketball. I, I, I think I'd like him. I think you can tell it's not your first choice, but then again, they're not getting their first or second choice at yeah. this point. But I think you could do a lot worse than, than shirts. I think he would bring in a level of. Who again, would you I'm, say is worse than shirts? Uh, I'd rather have shirts than Pat Kelsey. See, I, I, I don't, I just told you, I don't know anything about Pat Kelsey. And I think I disagree with that. <laughs> His teams at least make the tournament. Charleston's somewhat closer to the, what we're talking about than Indiana state is. Uh, Indiana state's in a better conference than Charleston. And I mean, Charleston's in the CAA. You're telling me a CAA you're right, no, job. You're right. I but mean, the size of the job. I mean, like they've been a tournament team somewhat decently. Charleston. I mean, they were really, really good last year. They, they were good this year. Yeah. They were really good last year, but, but I just, not as much of a difference. I, I think, I think CAA to ACC is a much bigger jump than, than Missouri Valley to the ACC. The only, I, I think that you have to keep in mind, like the specter of Kenny. Yeah. Um, It's going to be very hard to sell anybody on the next head coach having almost any of the same weaknesses that Kenny had. Every new coach is going to have some weakness, but I think, I mean, has Pat Kelsey ever coached a guy who's paying players either? That's not, that's a good, (laughs) that's a fair enough question. Maybe, but I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. Uh, I just think that you're going to want to err on the side of experience when, where you can. Uh, which is interesting because I think Dusty May really just has the one year. Uh, uh, I, I, I I I say the two years, but yeah, but I, I mean, mean obviously years, but that's yeah. still uh, you know, Ant Wright. I saw him the the other day was talking about you know one of the things he would really like in a candidate, and of course they ended up hiring Dusty May, so tough shit. But <laughs> is is seeing a coach who's had success outside of like just a single group of players. You know, like like instead of just cashing in on having success with just one group of guys, and as soon as they're gone, he's a gone too. Uh, I don't really know who meets a no lot one. of that criteria. I mean, Chris Mack, when Louisville hired him at that, that's yeah. what made him such an appealing candidate. But a lot of times, I mean, Will those... Wade in that way does. Uh, I would, I would, I would be. I think the thing to keep in mind with Will Wade is, in this, I think it, this covers Chris Beard too. Is it's not, and you hear this a lot. I'm so tired of us being concerned about what other people think. It's not that it's not that you're concerned about other people will think badly of you. It's that you will not have any benefit of the doubt or any grace at all for the guy to have any gray area on anything. The minute there's a question about anything you're done. And is that like when you're asking someone to come in and fill in and and fix it Louisville uh, and you can't ever have a questionable day is like None of like Will Wade isn't that good that you say, and Chris Beard isn't that good that you would say, come here and you can never mess up. But are they that much better than the options than the other options? I don't think they are. I don't think they are. I mean, that team, look, Chris Beard's team at Ole Miss fell the hell apart this year. Yeah, he started showing his ass at the end of the year, too. And can I just say about Chris Beard? Look, I know that that ship's kind of sailed there, and I'm glad for that, honestly. Um, (laughs) No one else has tried to hire him. Nobody. Nobody else has tried to hire him this offseason. Yeah. And there, there are a lot of big openings, right? And, and I, I think he's where he's about where he's going to be. And I don't think that Louisville's being unreasonably or even kind of unusually narrow minded in not really pursuing him. Uh, and I also worry about this place. You know, this place. And Louisville is different. It's not the same as a lot of other places. It's a lot closer to Austin than the other places where Chris Beard has lived and been successful. And Austin just about killed him. (laughs) And I, (laughs) I don't like, while I think he is clearly a very good basketball coach, I don't know that he would thrive as a human here. And that's not good for either side of it. That, that, that's why that's why I never felt like Chaka Smart was a legitimate candidate either because he kind of took the swing at do you sex again Texas yeah. 
And he, it clearly did not work. He had some good teams, never had success in the tournament. And I think Marquette is a much, much better fit for Shaka Smart. And, yep. and he kind of sees that, okay, I took the shot at the big money program. Didn't work out, whatever. Now I'm still at a top 20 job, but I'm in the same city as the Bucks and in the state that loves the Green Bay Packers more than anything. That That's why I never really thought as... And he gets to be an underdog. Yeah. And I, I really... Uh, I think he and Charlie Strong are great examples of... Uh, I think Chris Mack is like this. Like I think that there are guys who are made to be coaches at underdogs. And their whole ethos and their whole everything about them is no one believes in us and we are going to scrap and we're going to make it work and all this stuff. And nobody at the University of Texas believes any of that. Right. Like, and I think, you know, Charlie went down there from here and these guys are like, you know, when Charlie was at Louisville, he's like the St. Junior College, you know, to players at, at Louisville's practices because that's where some of them came from. Right. Uh, th there are none of those guys at Texas. To, to try and sort of you know break them down and be like you know you guys aren't good enough to be uh you know that sort of thing like the Louisville guys knew they needed Charlie yeah, like the they Texas knew guys felt like they were you know they've been good their whole already. lives yeah. that's exactly <laughs> and I think that I think uh, Shaka had the same problem at Texas you know you're you're getting the absolute top shelf top of the top guys and the AAU circuit in Texas is actually kind of great yeah uh, he, but those guys they're not poor hungry and driven they've they've been great for a really long time. And he's found a place that really fits. I don't think Louisville really can take a guy that has an underdog mindset. Uh, like I think Chris Mack had that, and his style of play, and 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 the the prickliness at all perceived slights at at Xavier that flies, because you got to fight for for limelight and attention and all of that. And at Louisville, you don't have to do any of that. You don't have to do any of that. I would fight back on that from one aspect from the standpoint of what Louisville basketball is and what it's fought for and the football side really, really on this. But I mean, it's always, you know, comparing to Kentucky and, it, and, yeah. and there is that angle of, you know, and this is in no slight of Louisville at all. I mean, Louisville is a top six, seven program all time, but Kentucky's probably number one as much as a kid that grew up in Louisville went to Indiana. What doesn't want to say that they're probably number one and, and they're but, 60, 70 miles down the road. And Louisville is as big as a fish as there is across the country, but you're always fighting that one in Lexington as well. Well, what, what I think you're right. I think you're a hundred percent right. So I want to give, I want to say, I totally agree with you on that. I think this is where Louisville is both. Louisville yeah. is a big fish who is in a state that's like, no, you're not. Yeah, Louisville and, is a big fish you, in one of the biggest oceans. That there, yeah, that there well, is. and you've, what I think, this is where Patino was. Patino had that chip on his shoulder, like, about them, and so did Tom Jurich, really, uh, but also was like, I'm the best coach in the world. Yeah. So, you know, Rick was was both, and I think, you know, to the extent that you – that that is this is where I think Richard and Will Wade kind of stick out as guys who would be fed by by both the adulation and the paranoia. And Louisville fan paranoia is weaponizable if you want it to be. And I think that with Chris Mack and with Kenny Payne, it was like, I think I'd rather hide from that. But with Rick Pitino and, and with Danny Crumb, I was like, I think I'd rather try to unleash this on some. I'm going to make this somebody else's problem. <laughs> you know, I'm going to browbeat them into playing this game. I'm going to whatever it might be. Uh, so a guy who sees uh, the the absolute insanity of this fan base as something to be wielded is to me should should be number one. And I don't even know that Dusty May was that guy. Yeah, I mean, but that's I, the I, thing. I can't tell you that I know who is. Right. I want to, I want to, before we get out of here, I want to talk about the Kentucky stuff also, but oh, there sure, is sure. one, one more coach. Guy. K. Yes. Coach K. I, one of my best friends from college, Cam Drummond writes for the Herald leader. And I've had him on the podcast before. It's about recruiting. Imagine. He's never going to hear the end of that. one. Oh, <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, if I'm Cal Perry, like, th like there's no way that didn't happen on purpose. You I mean, know what I mean? Like, how do you, how does that happen, man? <laughs> like a lot of really good reporting on, on UK. So like, I don't want to yeah, throw all above them. average, like staffed sports department yeah. and everything compared to most kind of local papers. Yeah, they're really, which honestly makes it even more shocking that they would make that yep. mistake. I mean, it's just, it's stunning, <laughs> but 
The the other dude that I want to ask about that we mentioned him a few times and he's kind of baited um in 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 out of things that the longer this search has gone on that I still really, really love is Jerome Tang. Like I think, you know, when especially when there was so much emphasis on Scott Drew early on, you can't get Scott Drew. Well, lo and behold, there's his lead assistant for 18 years that just made the Elite Eight two years ago. I get it. It's a smaller sample size, but he has been a head coach. He brings an enthusiasm and and energy that I think would be really, really good here at Louisville right now that would, you know, he would be able to win the press conference for whatever the heck that means, which I don't think it means very much. But you would win every press conference. He could yeah. talk. Yeah, and I think he'd be very interactive with the fan base in a way that would – Work and he's won games even in a down year this year where you know he had the Naquan Tomlin thing which he wasn't very happy with Kansas State administration about uh, where he ended up up having to boot him off the team he ends up at Memphis he had some injury issues they still beat Kansas at home I mean you talk about Louisville Kentucky and that rivalry and all that stuff Kansas Kansas State they hate Kansas in a very similar way to what Louisville hates Kentucky they hadn't beaten Kansas at home two years in a row since 2008. It's been 15 years. I get this one, 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 one wasn't one of Kansas's better teams, but they were still in the round of 32 in a four seed. And they beat Kansas at home. They had four ranked wins this year. I think you could do a lot worse than Jerome Tang. And, and I think he'd be yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. I, uh, I know that like, uh, for instance, Mike Rutherford, I guess said that, uh, you know, that he's not being all, he- all that heavily considered. And it sounded like, like that was in, like for a reason. But I would be totally lying to you if I said I had any idea what the reason is. I I am, like all things being equal, I would take him over anybody, over anyone uh, else right now. It, I, I, I would. over everyone that we've talked about, over Pat Kelsey and Shaheen Holloway or Shirts or Richard Pitino or Will Wade or any of these guys. I would too, um, because I think he's a teacher and a communicator, and I think this job desperately needs if if i'm gonna have a coach that's not well-rounded that's like extra of something being an extra good self-aware communicator would come in pretty handy right now you know i i I think uh look kenny's results were going to get him fired no matter what but they he was fortunate to last two years because he also couldn't talk you couldn't interpret what was happening couldn't sell a vision to anybody players or coaches any or you know fans anything uh, and I, I think Jerome Tang would be spectacular. Uh, and so I'm hoping that now that you sort of freed up to reboot this thing, uh, that he gets a little bit more of a look. I'm totally with you. I I love the way they sort of makeshifted rosters really kind of back-to-back years at a place, again, it's K-State. This is not Kansas. This is K-State. Right. Uh, and the Big 12 was murder yeah. this year. <laughs> And so I, I think he, and it's only going to get wonderful. even better with, with, you know, some, some tiny school called Arizona joining right year. Colorado too, for that matter. Yeah. That Colorado right, team back. is fun, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So look with, uh, with Calipari, I know you wanted to, uh, to talk about this yes. for just a second, at least I still, um, I'm amazed that it's possible they would pay 33 million for that to, for him to go away. Um, but I, I'm not sure they like that they can really do that. But I'm also sure they I'm not sure they can't. Like right. it, I, it's it's broken to use a Kennyism. It you know, and he has spent the second half of his tenure at UK receding from the people whose help he needs the most right now. You know, and, and I don't I don't know what he could do. Uh, short of endorsing trump or something like to get what's that's not gonna happen with cal i know but you know what i'm saying like he's just so far removed from them and i uh, i've said it this way a lot and so this is not new material to anybody's ever listened to me but i think kentucky fans really miss college basketball and i that and cal has basically intentionally set himself up as uh, i'm doing something different this is actually a life-changing camp for young 18 and 19 Damn year olds. Cow. And we're we're going to succeed at college basketball by trying to succeed at these kids. And a lot of Kentucky, so I don't really care about the SEC tournament. I kind of care about the NCAA tournament. I really care about draft day. Now, that formula worked really well at college basketball for the entire first time, half of his uh, tenure there, but it doesn't now. And when you're getting beat in the first round, you know, by Oakland, 
people don't want to hear about how much whatever player's life has been changed. Seven His life's been changed. Yeah, like, great, you changed Case and Wallace's life. My life sucks because the team that I like just got eliminated by a dude who's going to work for Charles Schwab one day or something. Who was literally a DoorDash driver last year. Like the Hillsdale, like a player at Hillsdale, <laughs> a backup at Hillsdale. And, and I think in particular, it's the it's the way. It's not just – it's how simplistic it looks. I think it, it, if you look at uh, bad teams in the SEC – or Shaheen Holloway, St. Peter's team, or this game against Oakland, the number of people who not just were like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is just like, they just keep running the same play over and over again. Yeah, and, and they've done it. And I mean, he did when the portal opened, he tried to pivot a little bit. I mean, he had the year, you know, he got cheap while he won national player of the year out of the portal. Yep. He's, he got, you know, he built a team of veterans with C.J. Frederick, Jacob Toppin, Keon Brooks, Severe Wheeler, all those dudes, and they lost to St. Peter's. Then he runs it back, doubles down on the freshman stuff, and they lose to Oakland. So, like, they're losing it in different ways now. And, yeah. and you know, he's he's staying committed now to the freshman. But he did try the transfer thing, and that didn't work either. So, so I do think the one thing that's interesting, Andy Staples of The Athletic um, had a video clip about this a couple days ago saying, you know, it's not 33 million up front. It would be yeah. deferred out through the end of the contract in 2029. And if Cal were to get a different job, Michigan was the one they threw out there. That's obviously not going to be the case anymore, but but um he's not going to be the Louisville head coach. That's not happening either. Right. Um especially after, you know, they just fired one of his best friends and Kenny Payne. He's not going to come here after that. That but but if he were to get another job, that would also get knocked off the contract. So maybe something like that happens, but I just, I don't see a scenario where he doesn't come back because it, that's just a lot of money, man. And I get it. There's a lot of coal money out there in Eastern Kentucky and Kentucky fans are absolutely pissed off, but it, it, it's a fascinating, fascinating position for Mitch Barnhart to be in. I'll, I'll also add, look, I understand their angst. And I understand why his shtick is get gets very old, uh, and that the last half of his tenure at UK has not been as good as it was at the I, beginning. I would say I'd almost split it up into thirds, because you have the first five years, twenty ten to twenty fifteen, we're in the final four three four times. You win the title, then you have twenty fifteen through twenty twenty, where you're still really good. You're getting high seeds. You're making second weekends, but you know you you have the buzzer beater against Luke May in Carolina. You you lose the to Tom Creed at Indiana in the second round. You lose to Kansas State, a nine seed, when all you got between you is a nine seed, Loyola Chicago and Nevada between the final four. And you lose to an Auburn team in overtime in the Elite Eight, who you blasted by 35 earlier that year, which it's still bad, but like that's, you know, you're in the second weekend every year, like, like whatever. Then you look at post COVID. That's where it's really taken another massive step of first round losses upsets and, and all the struggling from the last four years that, that, that what we've seen. So I'd almost break it into thirds instead of just first half, second half. But with either, you're right. But either way, uh, um, you know, I think I heard Jay Billis and Seth Greenberg and Jay Williams, like they were in Reese Davis, they were all debating what Kentucky should do. And uh, I think it was Seth Greenberg that said basically, or it was Billis, one of the two of them, they're basically like, there are two people that are perfect for Kentucky, and they've already had both of them. And John Calipari and Rick Pitino. Pitino. <laughs> you can rid yourself of Cal if you want, and I understand why they want to do that. They will not hire somebody that's as good of a fit as Cal. They just there is nobody wired with their because I think Kentucky's like this. We were talking about Louisville fans, like we're a little fish and a big fish. Like Kentucky fans are the best. They're the fans of the best program and also intensely ready to pounce on anyone who doesn't also agree with them immediately. And so is Cal. And so like I, you can get somebody who's a, a better X's and O's guy. You, uh, you know, and that sort of who cares about the sec tournament and stuff. It, it, you're going to miss this guy. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. Uh, and I'm not saying the next guy won't be successful, whoever it might be, but they're going to miss that attitude 
and I, I I'm calling it like you know six seven ten years down the uh, ahead of time or whatever. They'll hire somebody who doesn't have Cal's ego, and then the next guy after that will, and they'll love that guy. Guaranteed. So you're saying 2030 coach uh, Kentucky will wait. That's right. <laughs> but but I mean, I'd say, you know, I, I know Matt Jones are out on his Twitter space last night, which, side note, very funny that Louisville and Kentucky media discovered Twitter spaces over the weekend. Yeah. It was very funny. But, but I mean, Jay Wright's a dude, Hall of Fame coach, two titles, all that stuff, incredible. But at the same time, I'm like, he's a dude that kind of go back to what he said, like shocking all that stuff earlier. He liked the fact that he could be in Villanova and, and no one talked about him until mid-February. Like yeah, he got all was, the benefits of Philly without any of the without any of the shrapnel. I mean, he could go, yep. he could go to the beach in the summer and no yep. one would care. And I would look at that and I would say, We got mad at Chris Mack about going to the lake. Yep. <laughs> I mean, Kentucky fans get incensed at Calipari for all all these little things. You really think Jay Wright wants to leave his comfy CBS chair and enter into that? I, I just one, I don't I, I don't think Jay Wright obviously would want to do that. And two, I don't think that's the best fit for him either if he were to actually want to get back into coaching, which I don't think which from all I don't know who is. Yeah. At Kentucky. I don't really like if you ask me, hey, they're gonna buy out Cal. But I know who's a perfect fit for Mitch Barnhart. Scott Drew. That's right. But he's not gonna be coaching Mitch Barnhart. He's gonna be right. the coach of Kentucky. He's gonna work for Mitch Barnhart. But like, like I'm I don't I don't know that Scott's going to eat up every little ounce of the insanity like Cal did for the first half of his tenure there. Cause even he started to kind of spit it out later, but for a while it was like, this is all fuel. Yeah. He, he'd, he'd stand up there at, at big blue badges. You people are crazy. And, and How about Will Wade for stuff, Kentucky? Yeah. I mean, I think that'd be a great fit. <laughs> that would be, that'd be hilarious. I think it, it, it'd be, um, Man, that, that that would be a great fit. It really would. But let's do this. One last thing, because I know you got to get out of here before we do this. It, it is March, and I would I would hate myself if I didn't at least say anything about the NCAA tournament. Oh, yeah. Sweet 16, going into this, give me a revised Final Four for you. Uh, I'm Mine is still intact. Uh, so I, I think I had what I had UConn and Arizona on one side. Uh, this is so boring, Crane. Like, so you know, shame <laughs> on me. Uh, but I have three ones and a two. I have UConn and Arizona and then Purdue and Houston. And I've got uh, Houston and UConn in the final. And I really, I, I pray that that's what we get. You know, I, I think getting the the best and most intricate offensive team against the best defensive team uh, in the finals would be wonderful. Uh, I, I, I think... I feel good about those four still. I think maybe the place where I've messed up the most is I I was a big skeptic of Duke coming into the tournament. They just haven't impressed me, and they beat the ever-loving shit out of James Madison yeah. in a way that they really – I was shocked by. So uh, I may need to give them a second look, but I'm sticking with my Final Four uh, for right now, and I have UConn winning the whole thing again. So I actually had the same exact Final Four as you. And I brought, I, I pulled my bracket off the refrigerator because I have never had a weirder bracket to wear through the first weekend. I have my final four intact, but look at all that red. <laughs> and just your final four? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much just my final four. Yeah. I have gotten almost nothing else right, which is phenomenal. I, I knew my bracket was cooked. I had BYU and um, uh, who was the second game of, of the, oh, I had BYU and Mississippi State in, in the Elite Eight and they lost the first Ooh. two games on Thursday. I had James Madison, the Sweet Sixteen. I actually thought I was being clever uh, with them. So yeah, I'm, I had, sticking, I had, I'm sticking with mine. Yeah, I UConn had, I looks had, like they're on a different level to me. God, UConn. Oh, we sat here all year. We said UConn, Purdue, Houston, best three teams in the sport. And then UConn, or uh, rather, Purdue loses that game to Wisconsin in the Big Ten tournament. Houston gets shellacked and has the the front court injury issues, and people started to back off those two. And I'm like. No, I, I, we watched this all year. We know those are the best three teams, and I think they're gonna be there. I got UConn beating Purdue in the final. Um, I think that would be another spectacular matchup to see. You know, the best team in the country against the best player in the country it would be spectacular to watch. It would be interesting to see how how Purdue handles um, Houston's physicality in a Final Four matchup. But, but it, it's definitely been a wild one. Um, obviously. You know, Colorado had the fun, fun couple games there. They were great. Kentucky, Oakland was phenomenal. 
the o- double overtime game, Oregon and Creighton was spectacular. I do want to ask you this. Did, um, have, do you, are you aware of the awful coaching YouTube TikTok? Oh, video? I watched that whole eight minute, 22 second video uh, there. Oh, there's a second one. Oh, I got to get that one. I got yeah, that, that. That's, that's, that's link, why please. I bring it up. I'll, I'll send it to you right okay. here in a minute. But the first one was spectacular. The second one. <laughs> okay. Okay. All, all it is, it, it it's showing they they break down all ten of Golkey's threes against Kentucky. Is what is oh, what the guy. All does. right, I gotta watch that. And it's, I gotta watch that. It is if for anyone who just wants to hate watch Kentucky awful coaching on YouTube and TikTok. What if, if uh, it's about five and a half minutes of him just crushing Calipari? <laughs> what if what if Mitch Barnhart brings Cal in today and they just play that video, <laughs> just that, and then they just you write him his check and they like get the hell out of here? Like how great would that be? Oh, that would be phenomenal. But Mark, appreciate the time, man. Really, really enjoy this. It, um, hopefully, we'll have some sort of answer on this coaching search at some point soon. If not, other than enjoy the rest of the tournament. It's been. It's been great, and we still got two more weekends to go. So appreciate the time, buddy. We'll talk soon.